Hi again. Welcome back to Sociological Theory. How are you? I'm doing well. And today I want to talk with you about two theorists, George Herbert Mead and then Georg Zimmel. Mead, which you can see here from the dates of his life, was a contemporary of Weber and also of Durkheim, though he outlived both of them. You can see that he lived into the 30s, whereas uh, both Weber and Durkheim died more or less around the end of World War I-ish. Um, Mead is also distinct from those two men and from all of the theorists we've considered so far, because he was born in the United States, and he was prodigious. Uh, he graduated college at the age of 20, young, uh, became a school teacher initially, and then did his graduate work at Harvard. He went on to become a faculty member at the University of Chicago, which at that particular time was the premier sociology program in the United States, a very, very strong powerhouse of sociology. He taught a graduate course on social psychology, and he did not publish a book in his lifetime. His work, though, was typed up by his students, and they published a posthumous book, Mind, Self, and Society. And here is a copy of Mind, Self, and Society, which you can see, uh, the picture there of Mead. Uh, but quite an honor uh, to have been thought so useful in terms of his theoretical contributions that his students typed up his work and then put it together. They must have taken very good notes. Mead is one of the key philosophers of pragmatism along with John Dewey. Now what is pragmatism? It's a uniquely American philosophy. And so many philosophers are what are called continental philosophers. They come from Europe. This is the first and uniquely American philosophy to emerge. What are the characteristics of this philosophy? Truth, what's considered true, is relative to things like time, place, and the person. And ideas are considered to be true if they result in some type of practical benefit. So people will often say the phrase pragmatic. Uh, it's pragmatic to do this or that. And to some extent you could also say uh, rational and means end calculating. Uh, so it, it shares some uh, ideas with some of the key elements of the Enlightenment. But the notion is, is that humans act in their own interests and in trying to figure out what will work for them. Uh, what types of practical results will I derive from thinking of things as true in this way, and um, considering the um, idea of reality given practical applications. Mead also looked at something he called emergence. It's the idea of new identities being created through different kinds of particulars. Now, what does that mean? The example I have given here is uh, a hammer and that's one that you can also find in the textbook, um, that the hammer is seen as this object. A hammer has a meaning we generally associate with it, but it isn't necessarily tied to, for example, building. If you, for example, had a hammer up at the YRTC, the Youth Rehabilitation and uh, Training Correctional uh, Facility near UNK, uh, a hammer might, in that instance, become a weapon. And so emergence is the idea uh, that things, new identities for things, are created through different particulars, different situations. And what then happens is a new meaning emerges from that context. So the hammer, in and of itself, does not have a meaning embedded within it. The meaning is made from the context the particulars of association in that uh, moment. And that leads into four key principles of symbolic interaction. Symbolic interaction is uh, 
a subdiscipline within sociology, which focuses on certain uh, elements of how we use symbols in order to interact. And symbolic interaction is what makes humans unique in some respects as a species. No other species uses symbols which are abstract in their meaning and can be connected to a number of different things, which I just began indicating through that hammer example. Let's go through these key principles. They're not in your Kenneth Allen book spelled out in this way, but this is how a fellow named Herbert Bloomer described these ideas, which he derived from George Herbert Mead. So I'll say that in a different way. Mead did not come up with these key principles, but uh, Herbert Bloomer derived them later from the work of George Herbert Mead. What are these? First of all, humans act toward things on the basis of the meaning those things have for them. Okay, it's a lot of verbiage. We can unpack it. You act toward something based on the meaning it has for you. So, for example, you have a song that you really like, a favorite song. You might smile and enjoy that song. That particular piece of music has a certain kind of meaning for you, and you'll act toward it based on the meaning that it has for you. Uh, if you have, oh, I don't know, a particular object in your house, like an heirloom, that object uh, can be very, very valuable, and it may take on meaning beyond its physical uh, properties as just, say, for example, a lamp which you could turn on and off. You may associate it with family members you knew and who are gone. And so the meaning of things is unique to how individual humans act toward those things. Uh, they'll have a, a unique meaning. And again, no other species does this. They don't assign a particular unique meaning to some thing. So that's the first principle. Second principle. No thing is inherently meaningful. Uh, the meaning of everything is learned through interaction. And one way you can think of this is that children sometimes are given pieces of paper and scissors, and they're able to cut up those papers. Now, maybe a child will find your wallet and go through and find pieces of paper in there, money, and start cutting that up. And then, of course, a parent might lose his or her mind when he or she sees this happening. Uh, and so the child eventually learns, no, 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 money is a different kind of piece of paper that you can't just cut up. Um, so the child may be disciplined for this or told, no, this paper is different. And so the meaning of things isn't inherent in the object itself. It's learned through interaction with other people. So again, humans act towards things based on the meaning those things have for them. That's the first principle of symbolic interaction. And the second principle, no thing is inherently meaningful. Meaning is derived through um, interaction. The next two principles of symbolic interaction. In the end, the meaning of everything can be changed through interaction. Meaning is never fixed. And that's really what defines symbols. Uh, give you an example of a symbol, maybe kissing. If you receive a kiss as a child from a parent, you might see it as something pleasurable, an indication of love or caring. If you get kissed as a child on a schoolyard, you're playing kissy games or something, then that might have a different kind of meaning, something gross or strange. Then as a teenager, Kissing might come to have a different meaning still, uh, young adult. And then by the time you're elderly, say in your 70s, kissing will have a different meaning still. So the meaning uh, changes through interaction, and it isn't fixed. It's going to change over time. Fourth principle of symbolic interactionism, the meaning of everything is dependent on the context in which it occurs. So the idea here is if you have, for example, a stop sign that you encounter at 2 p.m. and it's a very busy street, you might treat that symbol differently than you would if 
it were encountered at 2 a.m. and there is hardly anyone around. Okay, so the context of something's occurrence is important for making sense of it. Humans are unique as a species according to Mead because we engage in significant gestures. So this is related to the notion of symbols and there's an idea behind a gesture and that arouses the same response in others as in the self. So here's an example. If I wave, um, that is supposed to be a greeting, a form of greeting, and that is a significant gesture. If somebody else sees it and they interpret it as, oh, this person is greeting me, and they might correspond with a, a wave, or respond, I should say, with a wave in return. So this is something unique to humans. Uh, animals do not engage in symbolic manipulation or symbolic interpretation. Animals make use of natural signs. So this is something, again, specific to animals. And it's based on their individual experience with something. A great example of this is the phrase, where there's smoke, there's fire. Uh, you can't really have smoke without fire. That means that they are naturally connected. It isn't a symbolic or abstract connection. They occur or co-occur, you could say. And so natural signs are very different from symbols because symbols have a human connection that's made, an abstract mental connection that humans make with them. And there's something that humans use in abstract ways. Let's talk about how that works through the process of interaction. For Mead, he said this involves three basic steps. All right. So somebody sees you, let's say today, and again, some type of initial cue is given. Let's say you're walking on campus, and somebody sees you, and they nod at you. You might think, well, what does that mean? Um, you might interpret it, though. Uh, say someone nods at you, you don't have a real specific meaning, but you respond to that cue. Let's say you nod back. You say, hey, how you doing? That person may in turn respond to your response. So the person may say, I'm great, how are you? And then another meaning emerges, which could be, oh, this person's asking a question about me, is inter interested in talking with me for a second. So a meaning emerges until the next cue. Maybe they keep walking while they say what they say, and you interpret that to mean they're on their way somewhere and they're busy. But a new meaning emerges, and then the next cue is given or not given. And so this is really the stages of interaction with any human being. And again, a unique aspect of humans in terms of sense making and how their process of symbolic manipulation occurs in response to and with other human beings. Significant gestures and symbols which we interpret through interaction allow us to consider the creation of the self. And the self was a central concern for George Herbert Mead. The mind, that's different from the brain in that the mind you could think of as a set of processes. Our mind uses symbols to denote objects. We assign names to different things around us in our environment. We assign names to our own emotions, and abstract ideas. Uh, we use symbols to talk to it ourselves, I should say. Uh, talk to our own mind, I guess you could say. Uh, and it's very strange when you think about it. Perhaps you've thought to yourself certain words like, wow, I'm really hungry. No other species does that. No other species talks to itself about the feelings that it has in order to understand its own bodily function. For animals, 
you don't go through that sort of removal through language and then bring it back to yourself to understand yourself. So we talk to ourselves, a very unique aspect of human life. We have to read and interpret other, others' gestures. And just like I said before about the process of interaction, uh, this is an ongoing process that rarely is ever over. Uh, we do it again and again, over and over, and uh, we get new um, information that may be used to interpret old information ad infinitum. We, in our development of our mind, uh, the mind allows us to not act out of impulse. We may have an initial impulse to do one thing or another, but the mind allows us to reflect and to say, well, is that a good idea? Or do I want to do that now? Or what could happen if I were to do that now? And so we are restrained from impulses. We do not act uh, based on um, uh, things like uh, in uh, impulses like animals, let's say, would have. And with that, we can imaginatively rehearse our behavior before acting. And this is really fun, I think, to think about. How many of you have had situations where you've thought about a person, you've thought, oh, I'd like to interact with this person. Well, yeah, I can imagine saying this to them, and then they would say this back, and then I would do this, and then they would do this. You can imagine a whole entire conversation or interaction. But what's hysterical to think about is that, of course, it's never going to happen the way that you think it will. You can imagine it, but that's not necessarily uh, anything to do with what might really occur. Um, the self is then a person's conscious recognition that he or she has both uh, a distinct individual component and at the same time is part of a larger society. A lot of us like to think of ourself as this unique, separate thing. Mead's contribution is to say, no, the self is always already part of society. It's in a dialectic, a back and forth relationship with society. And to show that, Mead considered the self as composed of two things, the I and the me, which he said was constant mental interactions that we had, which he called the I-me dialogue. The I, if you will, is the subject. And what I have down there is it's an unreflected impulse to do something. So let's say, for example, you're saying to yourself, I am hungry. And you uh, have this feeling of hunger, and you feel like you need to take care of that. So I want to eat. An unreflected impulse would be you would run away from whatever you're doing immediately. You'd run right to the cafeteria. You'd push everyone out of the way, and you'd start gorging yourself on the food there. Okay, That might be your I, the unreflected impulse. The me is the self as an object. So someone else is looking at you. And the way I think of this is through language. Let's say you were to run to the cafeteria, push everyone out of the way and start eating. Before you were to do that though, you might stop yourself because you might think, and, and hear the words, what would they think of me if I were to do that? Again, what would they think of me if I were to do that? So that's the I, me, dialogue. You're looking at yourself from the point of view of the other and considering your behavior, thoughts, whatever it might be, as something that you haven't yet released into the social world and checking to see whether or not you should, in what form, etc. This parallels the work of another sociologist, Charles Horton Cooley, and his concept of the looking glass self you might be familiar with if you've taken an intro social class before. The looking glass self, well, the looking glass is really just a, an old-fashioned word for a mirror. And so this is a fun thing to consider. That every day we imagine how other people are seeing us. All right. So if I walk into a room and suddenly I am 
being looked at by everyone, and they're all pointing and laughing. I am imagining that they're seeing something about me that is funny or bizarre, right? So I'm imagining how they're seeing us, or I'm sorry, how they're seeing me, how they're judging me. And then I would act based upon my perception of that image and judgment. So I might say, oh, what's wrong? And I might look myself over to see if I have a huge spot on my shirt or something else that's really, you know, uh, not normal. So this is uh, a process that we go through all the time. Uh, if, like, say, for example, you tell a joke today, and you tell that joke and the friends that you tell it to don't laugh, you might say to yourself, ooh, that joke isn't really funny. I'm not going to tell that joke anymore. Uh, that may or may not be true. You are imagining how they're perceiving you, how they're judging you. So it might have more to do with them, right? They're just not happy that day. But we do that imaginative work to understand how we're being perceived, and then we create ourselves in response. So that's really paralleling the work of Mead. We're always creating ourself in relation to other people. What's fun to consider is how your self is something that developed uh, over time. It was through uh, biological development, but also required socialization, required being in environments which would allow you to learn about how to be human and how to take on roles and uh, think abstractly. We don't come out of the womb knowing how to have social interaction and our sense of self takes years to form. It, it occurs through developmental stages and Mead was very smart for pointing out what those were. So when you look at little kids, say from birth to the ages of roughly two to four, Mead would consider those kids to be in something called the imitative stage. That is basically uh, a brand new human being is just responding to stimuli, trying to make connections between what it's doing and the effects of some of those things. So here's an example. Uh, I had a nephew, Gavin, and it was really cute. He's a little, little guy, maybe six months old. And, uh, He's in the crib and he's moving around and he's bopping and he's you know, using his arms and legs. And then suddenly his arm comes and whacks him in the head, right? And he looks around really puzzled and he starts crying. He's hurt himself. He doesn't even understand the limits of his own body and how he's connected with his own self, right? His own physical self. So he's responding to basic stimuli, right? Don't hit yourself in the head. Uh, and you can see some patterns of conditioning which start to occur with kids. Um, and the idea of imitation. So you see conditioning, very, very basic. Uh, you know, a parent will talk to the child uh, and the child will hopefully respond a little bit, will start that process. Uh, but also real basic imitation. Sometimes little kids, like say for example, maybe two years old, will start to imitate the things they see around them. I, I knew of a little child who would see the mail carrier come every day and put mail through the slot on the front door. And that child was playing with dirt in the yard one day with a bucket and took some dirt from the shovel and took it and put the dirt through the mail slot of the front door. So these are some ideas about practices or, or actions you'll see at the imitative stage. Then from the ages of roughly two to seven-ish, these are not hard and fast years when the stages absolutely occur, but the general time when they occur. From two to seven or so, you start to see the play stage. This is a very fun stage for watching children. Um, have you ever watched kids in this particular age group play soccer, for example? It's really fun because basically they don't understand the idea of positions on the soccer field or certain roles. They want to be where the action is. 
I call it beehive soccer because they're all just right around the ball and they're kicking the ball, they're kicking each other. Uh, the idea is, is the game is where the ball is. Okay, So in the play stage, kids cannot conceptualize more than having one role at a time. They take on one role at a time. Their understanding, though, the basic idea of role-taking ability, okay, if I'm in a soccer game, I'm going to be kicking the ball. So that's my role. What's funny, too, though, is that uh, kids don't get the idea of the abstract rules of the game. So here's uh, an example. I once played chess with a, a four-year-old, and it was a, f a really fun experience. I don't know why, but I, I went to his house, and there was a chess set that was all set up. And it was one of those chess sets that had both chess and checkers. And so um, Adam said, I, I want to play you chess. And I said, okay, I've never played chess with a four-year-old before. Let's give it a try. And he said, now, here are your checkers, and here are my checkers, too. And we put them on the side, and I didn't know what those were going to be for. But So I said, okay, let's play chess. And I take uh, my pawn, and I make a normal chess move. I move it up two squares. Adam takes his piece from the back, and he throws it at my pieces. And you can imagine my pieces start to scatter, and we're on a circular table and the pieces start to fall off of the table. And he announces, he says, okay, your pieces have fallen in the ocean and each one of them has fallen in, you have to give me two checkers. So I say, okay, I'm giving him away, uh, giving away my checkers to him and you can see where this is going. I make a normal move, he throws his piece. Eventually I tell him, I say, hey, wow, all my pieces have drowned and you have all my checkers. I guess the game is over. And he looks around and he says, no, 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 your pieces can come back to life. So these are kids that they don't get the rules of the game. They make up the rules of the game as they go along. And they are basically uh, engaged in self-reflection. You know, if I do this act, it has some consequence. So again, they have knowledge regarding the consequences of behavior. Um, and they're seeing their behavior as an object. But at a very simple level. They're beginning to see differences and similarities between their self and others. So they know that I'm someone playing a game with them, playing checkers. Uh, basic differences. The next stage is where you begin to see more abstract thought. The game stage. Roughly seven-ish to about the age of 12. Okay, around puberty. Um, here you start to see behavior based on the child beginning to recognize what's called the generalized other. And that's a view of the self from the perspective of an abstract outside group. Here, kids are more able to take on different roles at once and understand roles in relation to each other. So for example, I can be a forward in soccer and other people can, for example, someone else can be a goalie. We have different roles, and those are in relationship. And I can understand that if the goalie for my team is hurt, it doesn't mean we don't have a goalie. Someone can substitute in that role. So we have the ability to begin taking on many roles at once. You learn that you are a student, that you are, for example, a son or daughter, you are a friend. In your daily life, you may go to work later after watching these. So you're able to organize these roles into some type of integrated whole. That is important and something that actually in part resulted from your socialization. There are what are called feral children who have never been exposed to that type of play stage in order to learn how to take roles and if they've passed a critical point in development they may never be able to think abstractly in the game stage. They may never be able to develop a sense of self in the way that you have. You can take action and cultivate a sense of self and your behavior from a general perspective. So for the rest of your life 
you can think that, okay, even though I'm Kurt, I will act differently when I'm teaching an online course, perhaps, than when I'm seeing my friends or when I'm talking to my mom. And so the generalized perspective of different audiences plays into how we think of ourselves and how we believe we should act in particular circumstances. The final stage for me in the development of the self is the generalized other. And that's what you and I are in. We started around puberty and it will be the stage we're in the rest of our lives. The perspectives of others now can be generalized into a single view for us. So as an example, let's say you're training as a physical therapist. You have courses you take and you work to achieve that role later. You engage in what's called anticipatory socialization to fulfill that role. And what that means then is that you can go to strange environments where if you encounter others who are in that role or are needing you to be in that role, you can be that without ever having encountered those people before. Let's say you want to take a job in Minneapolis, Minnesota. You never necessarily have to have set foot in Minneapolis to take on that job and to know what the people who will ask you to fulfill that role want from you. You can say to yourself, okay, they'll want someone who's trained as a physical therapist, they'll want someone who's groomed, uh, who can communicate about physical therapy and the dimensions of it, what needs to be done, who can show uh, others how to engage in physical therapy, who can work within an office setting, who understands uh, procedures related to processing medical forms, billing, etc. Right? So the perspectives of many others uh, in your life can now be generalized into a single view, which makes you very different from feral children who cannot do this kind of thing because they had never gone through the play stage and into the game stage. What's also fascinating about us now is that the community, broadly thought of, now exercises control over us individual members through our having internalized norms and roles and beliefs. So the person you are now is partially uh, having taken on those ideas of something abstract, like for example, for me, other sociologists, and I have internalized norms, roles, and beliefs, and I begin to exercise control of myself because of that internalization. So what's fascinating, I think, to consider is how we're born, maybe an individual with certain aspects of personality. We've all known babies who are you know, ill-tempered or are um, very uh, nice and, and um, different, uh, but those little tiny biological aspects of the personality eventually are changed and transformed through social interaction, through the development of the self that Mead outlined, and we learn to, if you will, police ourselves. So the fascinating thing I think to consider today is the extent to which you are the person you came into the world being and some of your uh, predispositions, and then also how you are as modified by the communities and perspectives that you've taken on voluntarily and how you constrain yourself. The next theorist, Georg Zimmel. According to your text, uh, Mead might well have been a student of Zimmel in Germany. Um, so interesting that they are both in the same chapter. Zimmel, again, was uh, German, so he differs from Mead, but being German means he's, of course, similar to Weber and Marx. Uh, you can see from the period of his life that he was a contemporary of Durkheim and Weber, uh, and he dies around the same time at the end of World War I as both of those theorists did. Uh, Zimmel's father was a Jewish businessman, uh, and so being Jewish, um, or I should say having a Jewish family history, makes him similar to Marx, who also uh, had family um, 
ancestors who were Jewish. Uh, and uh, Zimmel's dad uh, was a businessman who converted to Catholicism, again, likely to uh, avoid anti-Semitism, which was fairly prevalent, prevalent in that period. Uh, Georg attended the University of Berlin, and in 1890, he married uh, uh, Canel, a, a woman who was also a philosopher, so he's very much an intellectual. He also uh, was friends with Max Weber. Uh, he was friends with Rilke, a, a poet, and uh, Edwin Husserl, who was a philosopher. Zimmel wrote a lot. He was very prolific. Dozens of books, hundreds of articles, and he uh, didn't want to feel constrained to particular topics, so he wrote about a lot of different things. That caused him some trouble in part uh, was part of the reason I should say why he had trouble finding normal work as an academic because his interests were so broad. Uh, and in some ways then that parallels the career of Marx who had trouble finding work as an academic and had very broad interests. Unlike Marx, he was able to gain an academic post at the University of Strasbourg in 1914, which was when World War I broke out um, and at the end of the war just before the end of the war, Zimmel dies. Zimmel assumes a human nature. And you can see in your textbook, uh, Kenneth Allen talks about how that's in contrast to Mead. Zimmel, for example, thinks that we naturally have a religious impulse and that our gender differences are intrinsic. Zimmel asks, what are the a priori conditions of society? And here you can think of uh, this as a new way of trying to understand society rather than simply using a, a kind of a mechanistic or organic analogy as would Durkheim or for that matter also for uh, Herbert Spencer. So he looks at social forms to understand this. And for Zimmel, he thinks they come out through human interaction, but they are imposed upon human existence. And so you see this um, a little bit here on, um, again, the, the Kenneth Allen discussion, uh, that society continues to exist and exert influences over individuals through these forms of interaction, for example, conflict and exchange. Uh, if you are involved in an interaction, basis of which is exchange, then that's going to uh, color that interaction, uh, as it would if it's more of a conflict-oriented uh, type of interaction. Zimmel differentiates subjective culture from objective culture. Subjective culture is how we individually embrace, use, and feel culture. So let's say, for example, uh, for hippie culture, let's say I'm a hippie and I like the Grateful Dead, the music of the Grateful Dead. I might use certain songs as a way of getting me relaxed in the evening and sort of as precursor to preparing food. So I think of maybe certain types of music as having a certain personal meaning and a particular use for those things which are part of that culture. But it's my subjective use of that culture, right? It's an individualized use. Objective culture, on the other hand, is the stuff that is separate from individual control. So for example, tie-dye t-shirts, those can be bought and sold. And you can find them somewhere and you don't even have to be a hippie in order to buy a tie-dye t-shirt. So these are different from our individual use because they become reified objects. They become objects outside of us that take on um, the meaning of that culture in um, a larger context. There's a, an interesting question you can think about with this. How does objective culture impact our subjective or personal life. So, 
for example, how do we maybe take on different styles of music uh, during different periods of our life? Um, how do we define ourselves as unique and special people in relation to the cultural objects we take on in a subjective kind of personal way? How do we maybe bring those together uh, in a way to make our unique self? Zimmel also considered culture as having three different components. And there are um, three here discussed. Uh, first one, culture can vary in absolute size. So the uh, large amount of cultural material can either increase or decrease. Um, you can have a lot of cultural products or fewer. Uh, you could say that these days the amount of culture around us is amazing. You can't even begin to know all of the culture around us. And that's something that um, Zimmel talked about as the tragedy of culture. And that means Zimmel uh, was sad that we have so much culture around us uh, we end up specializing in certain kinds of things and getting a very deep understanding of some things. But the tragedy is, is that we can never know or experience all of these other incredible realms of culture because we had to focus. Uh, culture today is so vast, it requires so much depth to understand even one or two or three fields that we can't know the full range of and complexity of human culture. So culture can vary by absolute size, it can vary by the diversity of its components. Um, again, some cultures have a lot of diverse components and some may not. Uh, as we've moved along historically, we have a lot more diversity of components of culture today. Uh, an example might be fashion. There are far more types of fashion available today than there were 300 years ago. Also, too, culture varies by complexity. So we can have cultural items linked or not linked and different elements that are linked increase complexity. Zimmel wrote a very important piece called The Metropolis and Mental Life. It was an essay published around 1903 and this was a very seminal essay in terms of people thinking about the unique characteristics of the metropolis or the city and how it comes to affect an individual's thinking. In urban life, what Simmel posited was that we are surrounded by strangers, people who are not known to us, and Simmel also wrote an essay on the stranger. Basically, if you've ever been to a very large city, you have a lot of freedom, and if you're a nonconformist, you can do a lot more of what you want to do. If you're from a small town, and perhaps some of you are, you know that idea of how people sometimes know your business very, very quickly, and there might be gossip. So there's a lot more social control in a small, uh, tight-knit community than there is in a community where you have more strangers. So you have a lot of freedom in large urban areas. And what people develop in those areas is what Zimmel called a blasé attitude, and blasé you can think of it as basically like a shrugging attitude. Um, they uh, ignore a lot of the strangeness perhaps around them and they become, you could argue, maybe even bored with it. So, for example, in Carney, it might freak you out to see someone who has uh, tattoos on their face. But it may be more common in New York so that it doesn't necessarily cause as much interest or uh, gain as much attention uh, because they're just it's just one of so many varieties of culture around you and strangeness around you. So people in New York may treat people more as objects and engage in what Irving Goffman called civil inattention. They just are interested in getting through their day and they don't treat people individually as special human beings. You have to protect yourself from constant overstimulation if you're in the big city. If you took in everything, it would be somewhat paralyzing. So in those contexts, People, ironically, perhaps, or paradoxically, I should say, have to work a lot harder to stand out. 
So you might see people with wild forms of fashion in an attempt to differentiate themselves from others around them. Also, in um, urban areas, you see uh, this idea of conflict, where two or more roles that are clashing uh, become more likely. Um, because in urban life, you have the development of secondary groups based on rational motivations. So the effect of being in these uh, kinds of situations, uh, you can see here, it'll talk about secondary groups mean uh, groups that are developed out of some type of instrumental need. Um, you need to finish, for example, this class. So right now you're in a secondary group. The people you are taking it with, in this instance, it's strange, you don't even know them, but if you were in a classroom, uh, they would just be people who you'd be hanging out with for a very set period of time in a set set of roles uh, that are limited by uh, time and rules, and those rules eventually end. Uh, they're based on rational motivations. So perhaps uh, you would experience role conflict more frequently in um, cities because you may have those primary roles like for example mother, father, brother, sister primary roles are deep long-standing roles and um, you accept the person holistically for all of their good and bad parts um, that might conflict with you if you also encounter those people in secondary groups which are based more on rational and instrumental needs and motives Zimmel contrasted life in the city to rural life, and most people know these things intuitively, but briefly, uh, rural life you see as slower, it's more regular, the patterns that you see are recurring in a kind of way that you could maybe predict. You see ongoing associations with people and in the same places, and rural life is about usually deeper emotional connections to those individual people. Uh, you could say that big city life is, some people say, very lonely, alienating, and superficial. Conversely though, it's hard to be very idiosyncratic or very, very unique within a, uh, a rural town because again, people know you and there's an emphasis put on conformity, on being more like other people. If you stand out, uh, it hurts more frequently. So rural life for Zimmel encourages those primary groups I mentioned in the previous slide. Primary groups are face-to-face -face, uh, interactions with people for prolonged periods of time. You know them well, they know you well, and they tend to accept more of you because they know you in a deeper way. And those are based on organic motivations or the idea that you accept a person more unconditionally rather than instrumentally. Instrumentally would be your interacting with a person to use them as a means to an end. Zimmel differs from Marx in some of his theoretical work because Zimmel does not think that there's really anything wrong with using commodities to create a self-concept or self-image. Zimmel says, why is that necessarily bad? You can see people who might use commodities to create their own distinct identity. You might buy punk records in order to feel like you're part of a subculture that you feel uniquely connected to. Um, the thing though is that even though he's generally okay with using commodities to create a sense of self or self-image, that this is just something that human beings do, he does believe that these days there are too many uh, commodities and they're so easily replaced that they lose meaning. So perhaps this is a problem, that if you consider uh, the commodities that you have and the fact that they can be replaced so easily, we go through so many of them in our lifetime, uh, they don't really have a kind of a meaning for us. And so really we, uh, kind of in some way similar to what Marx was saying, uh, we're not enchanted with them for very long.
Zimmel also theorized a great deal about money, and he did this differently from Marx. Money creates a universal abstract value system, and money is fascinating because money is usually associated with some form of government or a state. So there's this abstract entity out there that has created a universal form of exchange, a value system, that is really rather abstract. And it's strange to think about that, how we like to think that the value of a dollar remains constant, but in fact, it fluctuates depending on how it trades against other foreign currencies, and it might fluctuate even with what it will buy. Say, for example, how much gasoline you can buy for the dollars you have. Zimmel thought about some of the effects of money that are unique and are, again, uh, connected with the modern era. If you have this universal abstract value system, how does that change human relationships? One thing it does, it's amazing to think about, it increases individual freedom because you can pursue very, very uh, diverse activities. You might pay, for example, to learn how to knit um, or uh, you might use it to increase your self-expression. Let's say I want to buy a keyboard and learn how to play music. I can do those things, and I can do them through money. That's the medium through which my individual freedom may be increased. If I want to eat Thai food tonight, I can spend money and do that. Again, as I mentioned above, we can buy more things, but paradoxically, we're less attached to them. So because you can have more things and whatever you want, your attachment to those individual things really diminishes much more so than it would, say, for example, two or three hundred years ago, when the individual things you had were fewer, maybe were made by hand, and had more meaning for you. Money, as a universal medium of exchange, discourages more of the intimate ties with people that, again, you could see happening two or three hundred years ago. If people knew the person making the thing, uh, and they might trade in order to get that object, then that would be a more intimate kind of tie. Now, if you want a book, say, for example, on Amazon, you click a few buttons, the money goes to a person you never see or interact with, and you get that book in the mail, and that's the ex extent of your interaction. Um, instead of encouraging uh, a courage of personal relationships, people tend to think of means, ends, calculations. And so, for example, I think to myself, well, I can get this book from this bookseller because it's $19, and I might, for example, want to support my local bookseller, but they charge $25. So, meh, I don't have to necessarily um, support local businesses. So intimate ties and relationships with people may be, well be reduced with using money and calculating how to act and what you need, again, using money as a measure. Fourth, money uh, decreases moral constraints and increases anomie. So, strangely enough, money means that you can buy or sell, in principle, anything. That's where things like, for example, prostitution uh, might come from. Um, people can buy or sell um, very, very intimate um, services. You can pay someone to give you a massage. Um, you can pay someone to uh, clip your toenails, um, manicure your hands. Uh, so there are fewer um, moral constraints. Um, sometimes people buy money, or I'm sorry, use money to buy very bad things, illegal goods and services. Even though things are made illegal, there's always a market for those things. You can't suppress those from having markets. Um, and that also increases anomie. It increases a sense of normlessness because Money can be used to buy seemingly anything that will always emerge. Markets will always emerge for things that are immoral for people. Money changes social relationships from the traditional period through certain kinds of social effects. First, money because it's a, a universal way to establish value and to exchange, it creates re, uh, exchange relationships over 
a long distance. Long distance relationships become possible through money. Now, they may be very, very short and of um, quick duration, and you never know that person. But if you want to buy, for example, tea from China, you might be able to go online, find out who sells that, pay that money through a PayPal account or a credit card, and receive those goods. So it can create exchange relationships over very long distances, especially today with globalization, which we'll talk about in future slides. And it can create relationships over much longer periods. And that's a significant change from the past. If you, for example, are selling tea locally, you can create an ongoing relationship with a tea provider in China. And that's something that would have been maybe unheard of, you could say, in, for many people in the traditional period. Another social effect of the use of money is it can increase continuity among certain groups. So uh, money can allow us to uh, have a, you could say, a flattened or generalized value system by making everything sort of equivalent. Um, it creates objective culture, and that can overshadow or colonize more subjective culture. Uh, those forces make group culture uh, more alike than different. So money can, in some ways, really increase continuity among certain groups that come together around money, maybe hobbyists, enthusiasts, uh, people who want to support a political agenda, that type of thing. Money strengthens trust in a society. So as a great example, trust in the US dollars equals trust in the United States and vice versa. I said before that money is almost always these days tied to a state and a form of government. So you'll see on your money uh, the statements about how it's backed by the US Treasury, for example. Uh, that means that there's a political and social economic system that's all interconnected, which uh, gives that dollar bill a consistent value over time, and that it won't go uh, wildly uh, in flux if the state remains stable. Now, if you contrast that against, say, for example, Germany uh, post-World War I, their state was unstable, and the value of the Deutschmark sometimes changed very dramatically. They had what was called hyperinflation. So you'll see that, to some extent, your trust in your society is also the trust in the currency that you have. And that also, money uh, allows for and encourages trust in a centralized state, a state that is, uh, again, a universal, taking care of its citizens, um, providing the rules for how a society should be governed. 